Hey, welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about the second XRP valuation model called a discounted cash flow model. This is commonly used in the world of investment banking and evaluation of assets like stocks and businesses. And we're going to talk about how we're applying this very commonly used system to the world of XRP valuation. Hey, Molly here. Today we're going to talk about the second model in a series of financial valuation models that are being used to determine the fair market value of XRP. Now, this is a process that is being undertaken by a team of people. I'm one of them. I'm not actually the person who built this model. A very skilled and capable investment banker put this together. Uh, but I am sharing it for all of you so we can kind of collectively understand what are we trying to do here? What is the agenda and long-term goal of this particular project? And then what are some of the drawbacks to this model that we should potentially take into account as we build the remaining few? So the idea here is that a lawsuit happened, the SEC sued Ripple, and that consequently hurt the valuation of the XRP asset. It slowed down adoption of the XRP ledger and slowed down the development of the next financial system using XRP to move money in the world. And so we kind of approach this from, all right, let's say this lawsuit hadn't happened. You know, let's try to model out a bunch of different scenarios of how this could have played out if Ripple had been able to pursue their plans as they originally intended and the XRP ledger had adopted as it could have otherwise. So it's a simulation exercise. We're not forecasting that these things will happen because actually the sad reality is, is the lawsuit did happen. So that can't be undone. Now, I generally am an optimistic person, believe that humans are able to overcome a variety of things, including the impact of lawsuits. So uh, many of us, myself included, believe that we can make up for lost time, but that doesn't detract from this particular academic exercise, which is how can we quantify the value of this asset in a couple of conditions and situations? Why are we building multiple models? Well, uh, it's complicated. XRP is not like any other asset. It's not a stock. It's not a currency. It's not a business. It is a very efficient way to move value in a in a, in a world or a mechanism unlike anything that we've experienced before. So we're kind of trying to model a futuristic outcome, um, taking into account some of the, you know, it's a data model. So we have to take into account some of the inputs and the parameters that we do know. So the first model, which uh, I'll link into the description, was about collateralization. And that's looking at a very extreme scenario of all of the value in the world being represented on the XRP ledger and the value of XRP having to, uh, move all of that money. This one is looking at uh, a very different angle, almost the other side, where we're focused on the transaction volume. And we are kind of equating the amount of money that is being moved on the XRP ledger in this simulation with how uh, businesses are valued via cash flow, cash flow. However, when you do a discounted cash flow analysis, uh, one of the key premise assumptions is that the value of money goes down over time and that there is risk in the future because of things that you don't know of uncertainty, as well as the fact that the capital could be deployed elsewhere for a higher return. So we have modified a very common methodology, DCF, uh, discounted cash flow, to this particular um, simulation or situation. And I'm going to break down and show you what it looks like. Alrighty, this is an infographic that I created to explain how this works. Let me try to blow it up a little bit. I will uh, link the Twitter thread that accompanies this in the description. Um, but we're just going to talk about a couple of key assumptions and principles that are in this model. So the idea here is that we are measuring the present value of money in the future. And this type of model is adapted to assess the impact on global transactions, what we're calling uh, transaction volume, but is a uh, derived from the global GDP over a 10 year period. And that's one of the key assumptions that we're making is that it, it would take 10 years for full XRP adoption. 
And then we discount that value in the future back to the current year. Uh, now, all models have assumptions. You can't really build a mathematical formula unless you make some. So we've spent a lot of time going through these and are pretty confident that these are the best ones based on the information that we know. And one of those assumptions is that it would take XR 10 years for the, the ledger to be fully adopted. This model also is really just looking at transaction volume, which is another way of saying sort of the money that moves on the ledger. Uh, this could be sort of swift payments or things like that, cross-border payments. It could be trade transactions. I mean, there's a variety of different reasons why money gets exchanged back and forth, and this is very transaction-focused. However, we, are, uh, we do know that over time, as the asset goes up in value and it becomes more utilized, people are going to store their wealth in XRP. So XRP will be removed from the circulating supply over time, but this particular model does not address that. And one of the um, things that came up a lot in the last model that I wanna address here is, we know this model is not perfect in the same way we know the collateralization model is not perfect. So we're not claiming that this or that model is it's sort of the quote answer to this problem. We are looking at this challenge from a couple of different directions, and in some case, somewhat extreme scenarios. So this is kind of an extreme scenario of XRP being used, XRP being used to move um, all of the sort of transaction volume. And we're going to, for this particular model, ignore the role of uh, store of value. The future models take those other things into account. And our, our goal is that at the end, when all of these models are looked at side by side on a kind of a graph that plots all of them together, we can kind of see where they come together Where's the overlap, potentially like a median value. So while we are present, or I'm presenting these individually one at a time so that people can understand sort of the approach, what were the assumptions we made, what we're looking at it, uh, I would suggest that you reserve any judgment about what you think conclusions are until we get through all of them. I know sometimes people see a number in these graphics and they make the uh, conclusion that, this committee is stating that this is the value. So I just would like to be extremely clear. This is a simulation model. We are taking into account some assumptions and some parameters. And we, in this particular instance, are very focused on transaction volume. So, okay, a couple more things about how this model works. Um, we use what's called a discount rate, which is key to DCF modeling. Discount rate is a measure of risk and the cost of capital being deployed elsewhere. So let's say you were valuing a business, which is where this methodology is very commonly used, and you were looking at the cash flow that is expected to be earned or projected for future years. You know, you could be pretty confident about what's going to happen this year and sort of confident about what's going to happen next year. But as you go out into the future, there's a lot of things you just don't know. There's uncertainty about conditions in the market, maybe something could happen that you just aren't preparing for. So as you go further and further out into the future, the effect of this discount rate becomes larger because you have to sort of penalize yourself financially for long-term projections that carry a lot of uncertainty. So that's why you can see in this graph here that there's sort of a dark gray line and a light, light gray line. And over time, they diverge. And that is because the further out you go in time, the less confident you are about being able to make a projection. Uh, and we're applying that here as well. We also uh, look at a particular um, variable called a growth rate. So we made the assumption that the Fed, Federal Reserve, who has put into a place a mandate or a goal of a 2% inflation rate, let's sort of use that as our standard, but then we're going to model out a very low growth rate of zero, as well as a more bullish one of 3%. And this sensitivity analysis here looks at all the various combinations of various discount rates with the growth rates to say, okay, let's kind of see how these all sort of plot out. And then we actually chose to pick a fairly conservative one, the discount rate of 10% and the growth rate of 2%. In case you're not familiar with how to interpret discount rate, I have a little legend here that the higher the discount rate, the more conservative, which is my little bear here, so a more bearish approach, and the lower the discount rate, the more optimistic the viewpoint, which we're calling the bull market view. 
We also made some assumptions about how XRP would be adopted. Initially, we looked at it as sort of a static linear rate, but that's not usually how things work, especially in the technology space. So we started out with a fairly modest 2% growth, and we kind of jumped that up exponentially until we got to 15%. And then at 70%, we've seen in other research that that is often a tipping point that skyrockets adoption. In other words, when anything, including XRP, gets to 70% adoption, that will be market saturation and almost function like 100% because the gap from getting to 70 to 100 will be very, very short. All right, how does this model, Matt, this valuation actually work? So we started out with this assumption of the global GDP being at 104 trillion. We use that Fed uh, growth rate that I mentioned before of 2%. We applied the discount rate. We assumed 10 years to adoption, as I mentioned before. This brings us to a total transaction present value, meaning in today's valuation of 915 trillion. We use the circulating supply of about 50 billion, and that brings us to a price per XRP of 18,000. So this is going to be one of our lower limits because it does not take into account moving um, money outside of GDP, meaning other assets that aren't can, you know, part of that calculation. It also does not address any store of value. All right, I have a little description at the bottom about what discounted cash flow is and you are welcome to read this uh, infographic at your convenience. I'll put it in the description. Also wanted to quickly show you what this model actually looks like. We have a couple different scenarios here. So these are essentially um, Excel workbooks where you have a bunch of different inputs and then you forecast out quite a few number of years and that eventually gives you a couple of scenarios. We ended up using this scenario of half of the circulating supply being available for transactions. And then as I showed you in that sensitivity analysis, that calculates sort of the various different price outcomes based on some scenarios. So um, the team is actually considering getting a lot of these uh, programmed into a website so people can play around with them. Um, but that is what the DCF model looks like. The discounted cash flow model is was a very interesting exercise to go through because it is utilizing a pretty commonly uh, used methodology in the financial world. Uh, we know that there are some drawbacks to this model as there are with the collateralization one. So as we go through each step, we are learning and adapting. And eventually when we get to the end point, we'll have a document, a paper that covers all of them uh, and compares them side by side so that you can see how this works. This process reminds me a little bit like if we were inventing something and going through an iterative process. Some people have uh, kind of scrutinized that maybe we should have done all of this privately and waited until we were confident in all the models before releasing anything. However, some amazing things have come out of this process so far, and we're only sharing model number two of five, potentially six. People have reached out, they've sent us things, new people have joined this effort, and they would not have done that if we had chosen to be very private uh, about this valuation effort. So if you're watching this and you have your own methodology on how to um, value XRP, we would love to hear about it. Uh, sort of, we had a great example where I did uh, a thread in a video on the collateralization model. Uh, a former developer from Ripple, Matt Hamilton, we got in some feisty debate. We did a video a video where we broke it down. And this uh, analyst uh, watched that and built his own model, which he recently shared with us and is now going to be included in the paper. And that would never have happened if we hadn't been working through this publicly. So we are clear that we are not um, definitive in the quote answer for how to do this at this point but by engaging in this process with all of you in the community we are in a position to get feedback and learn much more quickly than if we had waited released all of it and then gotten the scrutiny and then been asked some questions that we should have taken into account so uh, we really appreciate everybody who has contributed positively to this effort i know this is bizarrely a very emotional topic and it's for some people, which I don't really understand if we were building these models about a Tesla stock or Bitcoin, I don't think the reaction would have been the same. Uh, but again, 
the effort here is to quantify the impact that the harm of this lawsuit has caused. So I think that is one of the reasons that this has become a difficult topic for some people to embrace. All right, I'll be back as soon as I can with model number three. Uh, we'll see you.